Um, moving on from the human health to uh, animal health sector of One Health um, and still from the National Centre, um, we're very lucky to have um, Kirsten Bailey here, um, who's a vet, um, who's traversed the whole spectrum of veterinary medicine, I understand, um, but certainly at the moment um, is uh, specialising in antimicrobial stewardship and veterinary medicine. So I'll hand over. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And there's a few non-animal people in the in the audience. Um, so these are the four things that I want to cover today. I want to give a bit of perspective on uh, veterinary antibiotic use in Australia compared to other countries. Um, discuss around the differences that we have some animals that we treat individually as patients, whereas we have others where we're treating the, the, the population. Some of the challenges we face by species and, and some approaches to quantifying antimicrobial use in Australian dogs and cats. So I came across this the other day, um, uh, the concept of an antibiotic footprint and uh, where human activities uh, involving prescribing in the community and in hospitals, but also in animals. Although I do note that in our, in our One Health approach, the environment is missing in this little infographic. Um, but thinking about our antibiotic footprint, we often see when we talk about veterinary use of antimicrobials, these are the type of infographics that we see in the media, um, comparing the, the volume of antibiotics used in uh, largely food producing animals compared to humans. And this is um, based on um, the weight of the antibiotic. It doesn't take any account of, of how many animals we're treating or the weight of the animals. And so in the media, and this is an article from Australia, um, again, when we're talking about antimicrobial use in, in agriculture, there's some use of um, international um, data to describe antibiotic use and no distinction that, is that what's happening in Australia? Are 80% of all antibiotics sold or distributed for use in food producing animals? Uh, here they quote that levofloxacin, ciprofloxacin and azithromycin were found in milk in Bangladesh. None of those drugs are registered for use in animals in Australia. And then there's a pretty inflammatory statement down the bottom that made me a little bit upset when I read it, um, which we'll just skip over for now. So what is the Australian situation? I think in trying to find some concrete data to, to present on this, I think one of the reasons that articles don't have very accurate data is it is a bit tricky to find. So we have limited data on antibiotic use in animals in Australia. The last report was produced in 2014 based on data from 2005 to 2010. And again, this is just the weight of antibiotic imported into Australia and then sold for use in animals. Recently, um, a paper in the Medical Journal of Australia um, did some rough calculations trying to work out what volume of medically important antibiotics were sold for use in animals compared to um, humans. And they came up with a, a roughly 60% to 40% ratio, which I think was probably a little bit kinder to the vets than, than, than maybe is accurate. I just want to put this in perspective of the populations that are being treated. So 40% of antibiotics are used to, be to treat 22 million people and 60% are being used to treat a population that includes 213 million animals. And so there are a lot of animals there that won't have received any antibiotics, but we just need to put these things in perspective. And there's no perfect metric for describing antibiotic use uh, in um, in veterinary medicine, we tend to use milligrams per um, population corrected unit, or we, or we have an adaption of the defined daily dose, um, which makes it hard to compare um, appropriately. So, but this is just a rough guide to show that, yes, there is more use in animals, but there's also a lot more animals. So in Australia, our regulatory system for veterinary antibiotics is quite conservative compared to other countries. Um, since the Swan Report in 1969, we've had um, antimicrobial prescription um, by vets, which has progressively been implemented to now include all antibiotics are under um, 
antimicrobial prescription. This is in contrast to Canada that has fairly recently in December last year brought in um, prescription for a lot of drugs that have been available over the counter. And similarly in the US, they brought in prescription in January this year. So we are nearly 50 years ahead of them in the way we've been prescribing antibiotics. This infographic shows the use of colistin, a critically important antibiotic, has decreased in pigs. This is from the UK in over a two year period by 70%. In Europe and the USA, enrofloxacin was introduced for use in, which is a fluoroquinolone used for um, use in food producing animals. And Ceftufer was introduced to the USA and prior to that Europe in 1998. There are also some fourth generation cephalosporins, um, cefquinome that are registered for use in Europe. These have been registered for cattle since 1994. Um, pigs in 1999 and more recently horses. So what about in Australia? So fluoroquinolones, colistin and fourth generation cephalosporins have never been registered for use in food producing animals. There are some other drugs there that aren't used either in food producing animals. In regards to third generation cephalosporins, we do have ceftiofer registered here and it has been registered here since 1995 for dogs, horses and cattle. It's supposed to be used selectively in individual animals under direct veterinary control. This, this is a, um, it's a material we've put together in collaboration with Agriculture Victoria using the ASTAG importance ratings. And these are the drugs that are available, the registered drugs that are available for systemic treatment in cattle. Um, you can see the majority of them are low importance rating. There's two high importance rating drugs, the Ceftifer and the Virginia Myosin. What about in small animals? So fluoroquinolones have been registered for use in um, dogs and cats and some exotic animals like um, pet rabbits um, since 1995. And we've, we've had some um, more recent fluoroquinolones um, introduced into the market. And then third generation cephalosporins, as well as keftiofer, there's also kefavesin, which was introduced in 2008. Um, and kefavesin is a uh, injection that provides um, coverage for about 14 days. Um, and it does have a label restraint not to be used in food producing animals and for use only in dogs and cats were indicated by antibiotic sensitivity testing according to principles of prudent use. So we'll come to that a bit later. So when we're treating veterinary patients, we can either be treating individual patients similar to the way um, GPs are, and that would um, be horses, dogs, cats, um, rabbits, and sometimes our dairy cows, or we can be treating the population as a whole. And so, Backyard chickens, we might be able to treat individually, but um, otherwise we're not going to pick up one chicken in that shed and treat it. It's just not practical. And so uh, the way that we medicate these animals is either by a feed and by water. If it's by feed, there's quite a, a lag in being able to order the antimicrobials in the feed and get them delivered and treat the disease. And by that time, the disease um, will have done its damage. Uh, water treatment can be instigated quicker and turned off um, and on uh, more simply. We also tend to treat pigs um, as a population and again in feed and in water. Dairy cows can have a bit of both. So they get milked twice a day and so they come into, this is a rotary dairy, and so this gives an opportunity for each individual animal to potentially be treated or siphoned off to be treated later on in the day. But they're also being fed while they're in the dairy, so there is a potential to um, deliver medication to a population. What are some of the other challenges of actually getting the treatment into the animal? So this is an extreme example, but um, cattle stations in northern Australia, maybe it's, um, there's an example here of one that's 50 kilometres by 50 kilometres. The animals are mustered by a helicopter and they're pretty wild. They don't see humans a lot, so they won't be getting a lot of individual treatment. Um, horses can be dangerous to deal with. They can be in pretty... Um, muddy, messy conditions that we're trying to manage infections in. We also 
need to inject them with fairly large volumes, um, which can mean that we need our owners to be able to give those injections properly. They can cause um, inflammation in the muscle and make the neck of the animal sore and then they don't want to have any more injections. So these are some of the challenges with horses. Um, dogs perhaps could be the easiest to medicate, especially Labradors that are happy to eat anything. Um, but you can see that there are sharp white pointy things that have to be dealt with if you're trying to stick tablets in. And then of course cats. The situation on the left I think would never happen. Um, <laughs> But in saying that, the situation on the right probably does happen, but maybe not as frequently as we, we think. Um, so a lot of the focus is on antibiotic use in food producing animals. But let's just think about companion animals. So three in five Australian households have a pet. And in a recent survey, 47% of pet owners allowed their pet to sleep in or on their bed. So, these are three approaches we've taken to quantifying antimicrobial use in Australian dogs and cats. So the first one, we used an um, insurance claim database from the company PetSure, and we looked at prescribing in cats and dogs. This represented 1.9 million consults. The next one to the right, the veterinary NAPs. This is a pilot study trying to um, collect similar data to what the other forms of NAPs collect. Um, trying to get vets to do this is challenging. So we've been trying to use vet students to collect data while they're seeing their rotations in their final year. And so it's a smaller scale collection of data, but it's more granular. And then Vet Compass. So Vet Compass is um, where the practice software management records are downloaded to this software and then can be interrogated by researchers. And so we have a PhD student, Brian Hur, that's presenting in one of the other rooms shortly, um, who's using natural language processing on this big data set. So I think there's um, more than a million cat consults and more than three million dog consults that he's analysing the prescribing in. So based on the pet insurance data, we found that the prescribing rate of antibiotics in dogs was 18.7% in cats was 10%, which is quite low compared to data from a similar time period in humans. The most common antimicrobial present, uh, presented, the most common antimicrobial prescribed in dogs was amoxiclav, followed by kefalexin and then metronidazole. And uh, the incidence rate was 5.8 prescriptions per 10 dog years. Dermatitis was the most common condition. Um, and there was some seasonality which would fit with the dermatitis being higher in summer and spring versus winter. In cats, the most common antimicrobials prescribed were amoxiclav and kefavesin. Uh, the incident rate was 3.1 prescriptions per 10 cat years. Um, so it's a lot lower than um, in dogs. The most common indications were cat fight wounds and abscesses, and there was a smaller seasonal, seasonal pattern in this group. So this is the data that's collected in the veterinary NAPs. Um, so for each animal that has a consult, um, collect data on their weight and their age and what antibiotic was used, the dose, um, the indication, how long it's been on, therefore, were any um, diagnostic tests performed. And so we had a vital year vet student and five of her colleagues collect data over seven months this year, and they collected data for about 635 consults. Um, and the most common antibiotics prescribed in dogs was again amoxiclav. Um, followed by kefalexin systemically. The stars represent topical treatments. In cats, we got a lot fewer, um, a lot lower prescribing rate. Um, so there are only 15 prescriptions, um, but again, amoxiclav and cefavesin were the most commonly used. So now looking at the vet compass data, surprisingly, it tells the same story. <laughs> amoxiclav followed by kefalexin and kefavesin overall, and that's a combination of dogs and cats were the most um, commonly prescribed antibiotics. So generally low importance antimicrobials were prescribed. There were no glycopeptides, no carbapenems, streptogramins or monobactams um, prescribed.
Of these, um, so the, the VET Compass records, um, Laura Hardy felt has been um, trudging through four and a half thousand prescriptions so far of kefavescin to see why they were why it was used. And so this chart just shows the top six reasons. Um, so uh, skin disorders, sort of like dermatitis, um, abscesses, which would, would, could be cat bite abscesses, and then traumatic injuries and more um, cat fight wounds before they develop into an abscess. Urinary tract disorders, dental disorders where there was a surgical procedure um, versus oral cavity where there was some sort of dental issue but no surgery. And then out of these four and a half thousand prescriptions, 15 had culture and susceptibility. So a label is not being followed. So each of these ways of approaching quantifying antimicrobial use in dogs and cats has some pros and cons. The pet shore data was big data. It was independent of the animal visiting a vet clinic, so perhaps reflected community prescribing more, but we had no dose or duration details. The vet naps is a lot smaller scale, but more granular. Um, we can find out where the diagnostics were done. Vet Compass, um, we hold high hopes for. Um, it's big data. We've been able to pull out dose and some duration, and Brian's currently working on algorithms to interrogate the free text to work on um, finding out if the indication is documented. So where to from here? Um, I think we really need to investigate the, the high use of third generation cephalosporins. While I appreciate the situation on the right can occur, how frequently does this occur and how, how would it go if we tried to educate our clients more on, on methods of um, medicating their cats? I certainly, um, my own cat got an abscess when I was a vet student and I took it to my vet and said, oh, can I have an injection? He said, no, you need to learn how to tablet a cat and taught me a very nice, neat way. And I have never had any trouble medicating my own cats or quite a lot of cats in consults. So I think there is, there is some technique involved in being able to facilitate um, treatment compliance. So in summary, there is variation between countries in patterns of veterinary antimicrobial prescribing, obviously, and this is similar to human medicine. Um, the regulation of veterinary antimicrobials is quite stringent in Australian food producing animals. Prescription is required and the drugs, the class of drugs that are registered is restricted as well. We have a number of different challenges involved in veterinary medicine when we're administering antimicrobial therapy. We have relatively low antimicrobial prescribing rates in dogs and cats compared to humans. Uh, and we plan to do future work to explore factors driving third generation cephalosporin use in cats. So Arjun kindly put this slide together, which has a list of all the people in the NCAS. Um, and I've added on Beth Metcalf, who is our fourth year vet student who did an awesome job with the Vet Naps project. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kirsten. Um, I had a, a mentor one time who said the first thing you had to do was tell people how to take a urine sample. And I think, you know, that's a problem in human health, uh, mm. asymptomatic bacteria, and obviously um, cat um, administration is important as well. And I'm sure our plastic surgeons would love um, that to happen more. Um, and our AMS programs for all the augment and other things we yeah. approve. But um, does anyone have questions? Because we've got some time. Trent. Yes. Other, like other, uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's Jackie Norris in the room. There, there is a recent paper where they did compare, um, I think, large animal vets, small animal vets. Um, was it dentists and doctors? And there was a lot of othering going on, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think one of the things is there's this huge focus on agriculture, but the drugs that are allowed to be used in agriculture are a lot lower importance, where with companion animals and horses, 
there's a lot more um, variety of drugs being used and close contact with people, which is potentially a bit scarier. Possibly. <laughs> Definitely. When I see some of their mouths and they've got to come in for a dental, it's like, how could you have that anywhere near your bed? Um, but yeah, I think we need to educate our pet owners and the general public in general. Like AMR is the same for pet owners as it is for the general public um, to understand when antibiotics are needed, what an inf a bacterial infection is and how to manage it at home. Thank you.